Welcome back, deep divers. Ready to tackle another brain-bending topic. Always up for a challenge. <laughs> what are we diving into today? Well, today's deep dive is something I think a lot of people have maybe heard of but don't fully get. We're talking about reformed theology, specifically its relationship with the idea of free will. Ah, yes. Free will and predestination, the dynamic duo of theological debate. Always good for a lively discussion. Right. Like, when I first started trying to wrap my head around it, Reformed theology felt kind of like this giant, intimidating jigsaw puzzle. So many theological terms swirling around. Oh, absolutely. It's yeah. a field known for its, shall we say, nuance and yeah. maybe a bit of a soft spot for complex vocabulary. That's one way to put it. So where do we even begin with something this intricate? I think the best starting point, as with any good puzzle, is to find the corner pieces. What are the foundational principles of Reformed theology? What's the bedrock? Okay, so like the cornerstone of it all, lay it on us. In essence, Reformed theology revolves around the sovereignty of God. It emphasizes God's absolute control and rule over all of creation down to the tiniest detail. So it's this idea that God's hand is in everything, guiding it all according to his plan. Exactly. But it goes deeper than that. Reformed theology also places immense importance on the Bible, on Scripture, as the ultimate guide for understanding God and living out our faith. So it's not just about saying God's in control and leaving it at that. There are specific teachings within the Bible that define this branch of theology. Precisely. And that's where we encounter terms like Calvinism, which often gets used synonymously with Reformed theology, although there's a distinction. Ah, uh, yes, Calvinism. It's almost impossible to have a conversation about God's sovereignty without bumping into that word. What makes it stand out within the broader umbrella of Reformed theology? Think of Calvinism as a specific expression of Reformed theology, kind of like a tributary flowing into a larger river. It zeroes in on the idea of God's sovereignty, especially in how we experience salvation. Okay, and I think this is where our listeners might be nodding along, especially if they've heard of the acronym TULIUM, right? Exactly. TULIBIM is a helpful, though simplified way to remember those five key points of Calvinism. Total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. Phew, that's a mouthful. It's like a teaser trailer for a whole other deep dive. Definitely a material for a future episode. You got it. So we've got this big picture, Reformed Theology with its emphasis on God's sovereignty. And then within that, we've got Calvinism, a more specific stream. But then there's this other term that always seems to pop up in these conversations, and it tends to trip people up. Hard determinism. What is that, and how is it different? Hard determinism is where things get, well, let's just say philosophically interesting. It might seem like it's on the same page as Calvinism at first glance, especially with the whole predestination thing. But it takes that idea to a whole other level. Okay, time to buckle up, listeners. Things are about to get meta. Basically, hard determinism argues that every single event, every decision, even down to the smallest, seemingly insignificant choices, are all preordained. Like we're all actors following a script that's already been written. So even something like, I don't know, what I choose to have for breakfast this morning was already decided. It wasn't actually my choice. That's the gist of it. Hard determinism would say that even our sense of having a choice is an illusion, just another predetermined part of this grand cosmic play. Whoa, okay, I can see why that would throw some people for a loop. It kind of makes you question the whole concept of responsibility, right? Like, if everything is predetermined, can we really be held accountable for our actions? Exactly, and that's where the paths of hard determinism and the reform perspective begin to diverge. Okay, but before we get into that distinction, I think we need to address the elephant in the room, or should I say, the question that's probably on a lot of our listeners' minds right now. Doesn't the Bible itself talk about God having a plan? Doesn't he know everything that's going to happen from beginning to end? An excellent point, and you're right. It's a question that's been wrestled with for centuries. How do we reconcile God's foreknowledge and his plan with our ability to make choices? It seems like a paradox. It does, and it's a question we'll dive into right after this. Stay tuned, deep divers. 
So we're back. And I got to say, that's a pretty big question to just hang in the air like that. How do we reconcile God's foreknowledge, his plan, with our ability to make choices? Yeah, it is a big one. Yeah. It's like trying to fit a square peg in a round hole, isn't it? <laughs> but, you know, the Bible itself doesn't shy away from these tough questions. That's one of the things I love about diving into scripture. It's not afraid to tackle the messy stuff. So how does the Bible navigate this whole God's sovereignty versus free will thing. Well, one passage that comes to mind is James 1.13. It says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Hmm. Lured and enticed by his own desire. So it's not like God's out there dangling a metaphorical cookie in front of us just waiting for us to mess up. We have our own desires that can lead us down certain paths, for better or worse. That's the key. The verse highlights the role of our own internal world. It's saying that we're responsible for how we respond to those desires and temptations, for the choices we ultimately make. Which brings us back to that million-dollar question. What does Reformed theology actually say about free will? We've talked about God's sovereignty, about him having a plan, but then where does that leave our ability to make choices? It's a question that's been debated and discussed for as long as people have been studying theology, right? right. And it doesn't have a simple, straightforward answer. It's not a light switch on or off. The Reformed view doesn't flat out deny free will. It acknowledges we make choices, but it puts some boundaries on it. So we're not completely off the hook. It's not a free for all where we're just calling all the shots. Right. It's not a free for all. Exactly. It's more nuanced than that. One helpful way to think about it is that we have a will and it's free, but it's free within the context of our fallen nature. Okay, fallen nature. There's another loaded term if I've ever heard one. Maybe we should unpack that a little bit. <laughs> sure, it goes back to the Garden of Eden when humanity first chose to disobey God. That choice, that act of rebellion, it had some serious consequences. It fractured our relationship with God and kind of messed with our internal wiring, so to speak. So it's like our default settings got a little scrambled. Exactly. Yeah. Think about it like inheriting a computer with a bunch of pre-installed software that's not so great. That's kind of what we're dealing with, this inherent tendency, this inclination towards sin Thanks. because of that broken connection with God. That's a really helpful analogy. So it's not that we're like robots programmed for evil. We still have the ability to make choices, but our starting point is a little off kilter. Right. We're playing catch up from the get go. We're not starting from a neutral position. And that's where the concept of God's grace becomes so central to the reformed understanding. It's like we're trying to run a race with a weighted vest on, and God's grace is what allows us to even take those first few steps, let alone cross the finish line. Which, of course, brings us back to a major theme within Reformed theology, salvation by grace alone. We touched on it earlier with the whole tulip thing, but how does that tie into this whole discussion about choice and sovereignty and free will? That's where it all beautifully intertwines. See, Reformed theology recognizes that in our natural state, burdened by that inherent sinfulness we've been talking about, we can't truly choose God on our own. It's like trying to, I don't know, swim upstream against a raging current. It's just not going to happen. I love that image. It really captures the struggle. So it's not just about mustering up enough willpower to say, all right, God, I choose you. There's something much deeper happening, a transformation that needs to occur. Exactly. We're talking heart change, not just head knowledge. Yeah. And this is where John 6.44 offers a really powerful insight. It says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Hmm. No one can come to me unless the Father draws him. So God takes the initiative. Exactly. He extends the invitation. It's this incredible interplay between his sovereignty, his pursuit of us, and our ability to respond. It's not about sitting around passively waiting for a bolt of lightning from heaven, but recognizing that call, that drawing, and choosing to answer it. It's like God extends his hand and we have a choice whether to take it or not. We still have that agency. Exactly. And that actually leads us to another really intriguing aspect of Reformed theology. It's like opening a door you didn't even realize was there and finding a whole other wing of the house. Ooh, I love a good plot twist. What's this unexpected turn? Fill us in after the break. All right. You are about to tell us about this surprise element of Reformed theology, this door we didn't even know existed. Well, it might surprise you to learn that being Reformed doesn't necessarily mean you're also a cessationist. Okay. Got to pause you there for a sec. 
For those who haven't encountered that term before, cessationism is the idea that those miraculous gifts, things like prophecy or healing right. that we read about in the New Testament, well, they stopped happening at some point, right? Like they were kind of time limited to the early church. Exactly. And it's easy to see why people might assume Reformed theology would line up with that view. I mean, we've been talking about the authority of Scripture, right? So if those gifts were meant to continue, wouldn't the Bible have a whole lot more to say about it? Right, like chapter and verse instructions, miracles, how to get yours today. Huh, exactly. But here's where things get interesting. Some within Reformed theology, called continuationists, would argue that the Bible doesn't explicitly state that those gifts were just for the early church. There's no expiration date printed in the margins. So they're not saying scripture is wrong. They're just saying maybe our traditional interpretation has been a little too, well, limited. That's a great way to put it. They might point to passages like 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, where Paul talks about those spiritual gifts. He gives instructions for how to use them within the church, but he doesn't say, oh, by the way, this whole supernatural stuff is going to fade away soon, so get it while it's hot. No disclaimer there. Interesting. Nope. So it becomes about looking at those passages with fresh eyes, thinking about God's character, his desire to work in the world in ways we might not always understand. So maybe instead of assuming God's done with those things, we approach it with more of a, well, he could kind of posture. Exactly. And it's really important to remember that Reformed continuationists, they still hold to all those core principles of Reformed theology we've been unpacking. God is sovereign. He's ultimately in control. So we're not talking about a free-for-all, like anything goes, any supernatural experience must be from God. Or absolutely not. It's about testing everything against scripture, making sure these experiences line up with who God is, with his revealed will. It's more like God has a lot of tools in his toolbox. Just because he often works through his word doesn't mean he stopped working in other ways, even ways we might call supernatural. I like that. God is still God. A great example is someone like John Piper, right? A well-respected, reformed theologian who's open to continuationism. He holds to that possibility that God could still use those gifts today, but always with the purpose of pointing people back to Jesus, to the gospel. That's the heart of it all. Exactly. Christ and his work in the world, that's what it's all about. So to bring this whole deep dive home, it seems like there's this amazing, beautiful tension within Reformed theology. We're acknowledging God's sovereignty, recognizing our own freedom to choose within that framework, and even being open to those miraculous possibilities, as long as it all points back to Scripture, back to Christ. Beautifully said. It's a tradition that's full of nuance, full of depth. It's not always about finding all the answers, but wrestling with the questions in a way that draws us closer to God. It makes you think, doesn't it? It really challenges us to, I don't know, expand our understanding of how god might be at work in the world yeah. and maybe wrestle with our own assumptions along the way right absolutely there's always more to learn more to explore that's the beauty of a good deep dive yeah. so until next time keep those brain waves buzzing and we'll see you on our next adventure
A man named Jonah called to preach the word But he ran the other way Ignoring what he heard He boarded a ship to Tarshish To flee from God's command But the storm came crashing down With the power of his hand You can run from the calling You can hide from the light But the Lord will find you In the darkness of the night In the belly of the great fish Or the depths of the sea His love will pursue you Until you're finally free <laughs> Three days in the darkness, Jonah cried in despair But God heard his prayer in the deep of the lair The fish spit him out on the shore of dry land And Jonah went to Nineveh with the message in his hand You can run from the calling, you can hide from the light But the Lord will find you in the darkness of the night In the belly of the great fish or the depths of the sea His love will pursue you until you're finally free You can run from the calling, you can hide from the light but the Lord will find you in the darkness of the night In the belly of the great fish or the depths of the sea His love will pursue you until you're finally free You can run from the calling, you can hide from the light But the Lord will find you in the darkness of the night In the belly of the great fish or the depths of the sea His love will pursue you until you're finally free Jonah cried in despair But God heard his prayer in the deep of the lair The fish spit him out on the shore of dry land And Jonah went to Nineveh with the message in his hand You can run from the calling, you can hide from the light But the Lord will find you in the darkness of the night In the belly of the great fish or the depths of the sea His love will pursue you until you're finally free You can run from the calling, you can hide from the light But the Lord will find you you in the darkness of the night in the belly of the great fish or the depths of the sea his love will pursue you until you're finally free until you're finally free so if you hear him calling don't turn away in fear for his mercy is a river always flowing near in the storm and the silence his voice will guide you home just follow where he leads and you'll never be alone 